Good morning and welcome to Worship Where You Are. My name is Nikki Baker and I join you this morning from the sanctuary of Pataskala United Methodist Church in Ohio, where I am the pastor. We are so glad that you're able to join us this morning from wherever you are. And we hope that you have a wonderful experience as you worship with us today. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, open our hearts this day to receive your word for us. Give us courage and give us hope. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Paul's epistle to the Romans. And it begins in chapter 5 and goes from verses 1 through 8. This morning I'll be reading to you from the message paraphrase. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's glory and grace, standing tall and shouting our praise. And there's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we are hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert to whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling short-changed. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. And Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for. And we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. I want to thank all who have continued to give by mail and by bill pay through your banks to the mission and ministry of Pataskala United Methodist Church. As a faith community, we have been able through your generosity to continue the Kids Eat Free ministry. Kids Eat Free, after the school's recess for the summer, offers pre-packaged lunches for pickup every Monday from 11.30 to 12.30. Each meal bag contains five lunches for each child in the home. We have only been running for two weeks, and we have been able to provide our community children with 770 meals. Your generosity matters. Additionally, your giving has allowed us to provide 50 COVID reentry kits for those who have been incarcerated and are re-entering society. 
Again, your generosity matters. Thank you for giving, and thank you for serving. Will you pray with me? Lord, we know that there is so much work to be done, far more than we ever imagined. We ask that you bless these gifts that have been given, that they be used for the work that you have set before us, for we place our lives and trust in you. Amen. Let's pray. As Jesus sent his disciples out into the communities, so we are sent to proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. We are eager to share your love without expecting reward. We realize that we will not always be made welcome. And when we are not welcomed, Lord, we pray that you would help us move on in peace because there are so many more places that need to receive your grace. May your spirit speak through us in truth. We recognize that your grace is for all people, so let us pray for the whole human race. Merciful God, healer, liberator we lift up before you all who suffer from accident disease their own folly or the cruelty of others 
Have mercy on us, O God, and forgive our iniquities. Fellow human beings are crying out against the cruelty of racism, sexism, elitism, and harm that has been done to their bodies, their minds, their spirits, and whole communities. We pray for all who have suffered in captivity of body, mind, or spirit. Hostages, abducted children, those enslaved by the greed of others, prisoners of war and political detainees, and those who have been mis mistakenly convicted. Have mercy on us, O God, and forgive our human iniquities. Many are suffering physical and mental abuse. Battered wives and children, those bruised and broken by those who wield power. Those verbally and emotionally abused and denigrated, left with unintended wounds, threatened with the injury of loved ones. Those sexually molested and all who are neglected. Have mercy on us, O oh God, and forgive our human iniquities. There are thousands who are reeling in loss because of the pandemic. Loss of life, loss of security, loss of place or home and livelihood, loss of hope. Have mercy on us, O oh God, and forgive our human iniquities. Holy God, help your church to do whatever we can to lessen the suffering of humanity. Encourage us as we entrust our own pain and grief to your healing hands. Let us not cease our prayers Lord, inspire us to appropriate action while any forms of injustice and neglect exist anywhere on this planet. Have mercy on us, Lord. Show us how to be your church no matter where we are. Equip us for the mission which you have entrusted to us. Guide us by your Spirit until we find ourselves standing where we have always hoped that we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of your grace and your glory, standing tall and shouting our praise as one body, healed and unified by your love. And we ask all this, in the power of your holy name. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in Matthew's gospel, beginning at, verse, at chapter 9, verse 35, and going through chapter 10, verse 8. Then Jesus made a circuit of all the towns and villages. He taught in their meeting places he reported kingdom news, and he healed their diseased bodies, healed their bruised and hurt lives. When he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. So confused and aimless they were, like sheep with no shepherd. What a huge harvest, he said to his disciples. How few workers on your knees and pray for harvest hands. The prayer was no sooner prayed than it was answered. Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. This is the list of the 12 he sent. Simon, they called him Peter the rock, Andrew, his brother, James, Zebedee's son, John, his brother, 
Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the taxman, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Judas Iscariot, who later turned on him. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Don't begin by traveling to some far off place to convert unbelievers. And don't try to be dramatic by tackling some public enemy. Go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You have been treated generously. So live generously. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Remember when you were in grade school, in high school, or in middle school? It just makes me shiver to think about it. Remember how hard it was to belong? It felt like there was always somebody judging you, your behavior, your academic prowess, your athletic success, your looks at an age when acne, braces, awkwardness, and body odor. Ugh. Whether you dated or you didn't date, or whether you attended school events or not. To belong, it felt like you had to meet so many unattainable criteria. You had to have it all together to fit in. You had to be like the popular people. To take risk to belong means that we open ourselves to further scrutiny from others. And willingly handing over that kind of power to another person opens us to all kinds of pain and rejection and hurt. During my own youth, I struggled mightily to belong. And I saw all kinds of youth who were struggling to belong as I'm a former high school teacher. While we think that this struggle to belong would lessen as we became adults, often we find that it does not lessen at all but it becomes worse. The verses from Paul's letter to the Roman church had some evocative language that really just settled with me this week in a new kind of way. That when we open ourselves to God's love, we find that God has always had God's door thrown open to us. That in our willingness to enter through faith into a right relationship with God, we find ourselves standing where we've always hoped that we'd stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and God's glory. But entering a right relationship with God has often been equated with us being scrutinized by an angry-eyebrowed God who would rather condemn us than be in a loving relationship with us. And so we often fear entering into that relationship fully because we want to avoid scrutiny, judgment, and condemnation. I'm just back from vacation for a full week now, and as I sat on my parents' porch in Tennessee last week, I found myself 
simply enjoying wide open space of the pastures and the hay fields that surround their home. I felt like I could breathe better and I felt somehow clearer and more awake, more in tune with God. And in the silence and the clarity provided by those physical wide open spaces, I started to consider what it would mean for me to stand out in wide open spaces of God's grace and glory. In the midst of the pandemic we are experiencing, as well as a worldwide awakening to racial discrimination. Now, I started to feel like if I opened that particular door of my own heart, the environment in which I have been raised and the way that I've grown as a human being, would I still belong? Now, as I was scanning Facebook this week, I saw some of the comments from my classes or my classmates from high school. I noticed that on one of my classmates' pages, after some heated debate um, from other commentators, something amazing emerged that several of my classmates scattered all over the United States had decided to get together through an electronic forum to begin discussions on racial injustice and the transformation that was happening in their own lives, moving them to take action. I was really amazed by their willingness to be that vulnerable with one another, especially after so many years. As I'm from the same town and raised in the same soil, I'm having my own awareness challenged. And honestly, I didn't know all that I didn't know and a person can learn a lot in a mere week. So even in my slowly awakening to my own privilege, I still ask myself, would I belong? Paul, in his letter to the Roman church, says yes. He says, Jesus died for us we, while we were still against him. This angry eyebrow God that I had imagined or that many of us imagine simply doesn't exist. God is loving and kind and compassionate. God knows who we are. He knows how we are made because he is the one who made all of us. We are made in his image of hope. And he has faith in our ability to transform, to grow, and be made new. All of this led me to continue in my thinking. I began to examine myself, not just about racism, but about interacting with people who are of different socioeconomic classes and different sexual identities as well. And I'm finding that I've had my head in the sand about a great deal of injustice all around me. And yes, I'm ashamed. Yes, I'm overwhelmed. Yes, I am saddened by the harm my own ignorance has caused, because for most of my life I have been a leader, first as a teacher and now as a pastor. My leadership has played to my privilege. Now, I imagine that some who are listening might be tense, wondering what I might say next. But in the gospel lesson from Matthew, Jesus entered the towns and he healed. And the number one thing that he healed was blindness. As I sat on my parents' porch, 
I recognized that I have been blind. And that many of the people surrounding me have been blind as well. I know that I'm not alone. I've seen it from those old classmates on Facebook. Sorry, friends. Not old, but you know what I mean. I'm seeing it in communities that are standing beside people of color and peaceful protests. I'm seeing it as people rise up with the injustices of removing rights from transgender people and health care. We have been blind. In Matthew's Gospel, when Christ looked out upon the crowds, he saw their bruised and hurt lives and bodies, and he felt compassion. And in Greek, the word compassion is connected with a writhing, twisting pain in the gut from very intense emotion. In Hebrew, connect the compassion connects with the pangs of childbirth. Jesus felt this twisting pain in his own gut that was similar in intensity to childbirth when he looked at those crowds and he saw their pain. Can you imagine being moved with such intensity as you look out on our world today? I believe that we are awakening to the pain that has been caused by our blindness. And as we see, we are feeling that gut-wrenching compassion and feeling moved to action, yet we don't know what to do. In In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus commanded those he had sent to go to the lost, confused people right in their neighborhoods to tell them that the kingdom of heaven is here, to bring health to the sick, to raise the dead, to touch the untouchables, to kick out the demons that plague them, and to live generously because they had been treated generously. Now, what does this mean for us today? Well, I think that's the question that we need to ask ourselves in our various settings, our places of influence, our families, and our neighborhoods. Who is out there in need of a compassionate response? And how do we follow Christ in compassion? Only as we risk asking ourselves the question, can the door of our own hearts be thrown wide? Only in our own vulnerability and willingness to be healed of blindness can we learn to see. And I believe that as we risk healing and as we throw open the doors to our own hearts, will we find that the door to God's heart has been thrown open to us all along. Yes, we still belong. God loves us beyond measure. And it is out of that love that wells up in us like a spring of living water that we can share compassionately with others that they belong to that we all belong together and we can give thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. Working
Receive this blessing. Go from wherever you are worshiping this morning. Go with confidence in God's gracious love and mercy. Go ready to proclaim the good news that God has come near in Christ. Go proclaiming that God's love is for all. Go and serve our Lord by using whatever gifts have been given to you to bring healing and hope to all people. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>